All right. Let's see. This is Jeffrey Crevero, and I'm conducting an oral history with Richard Lamberty of the Orlando Gay Chorus. The interview is being conducted in the conference room of the Center for, of Center for Humanities and Digital Research at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, Florida, on Tuesday, October 11, 2016. <clears throat> Which, by the way, happens to be National Coming Out Day. National Coming Out Day. I saw the, I saw the sign earlier. Excellent. Good timing. So, uh, Mr. Lamberty, thank you for speaking with us today. If you would, let's start by having you state your name and telling us a little about where you're from. Richard Lamberty, L-A-M-B as in boy, E-R-T-Y. Um, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and we moved to Orlando when I was five. We stayed here until I was 16, and then we briefly moved to Maryland where I graduated high school, and then I came back to Orlando and attended Rollins. Um, and then after Rollins, I actually came to UCF for almost two years, during which time I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and they put me on a medication. Um, one of the side effects of that medication was I lost the ability to read, write, and speak. And so, I was unable to complete my graduate degree at that time. Um, ended up moving to New Mexico, where my parents had gone, and enrolled in the university out there to uh, work in their computer science artificial intelligence department, which by the time I got there was gone. And so there was not a single person left on campus that even knew that I existed, and there was no one to help me with paperwork or any of the transfers of credit or anything. It was start over. <laughs> Um, continued to work on the degree out there, but got hired to work on a NASA project that I did for five years, and then moved to California, where I stayed for another 18 years before coming back to Orlando in 2005, um, basically to be closer to family. And so I have lived here in Orlando ever since. Um, I started dancing, you were going to ask about the dancing thing. I started dancing when I was 10 years old. I danced first with the Orlando Cloggers, which was a, a youth square dance clogging group that was sponsored by the city of Orlando. And from that I got involved in what's called round dancing, which is kind of a hybrid between square dancing and ballroom. It's ballroom dances and figures, but it's cued in the swaying way that a square dance is called. And then directly involved in ballroom from that. And, uh, but because of the arthritis issues, then it was like, this is not going to be what I do with my life. I have to have something else to do, but as long as I'm able, I can dance. And I've continued to do so for most of my life. Um, and that's taken me all over the world. In fact, I just got back from two weeks in Europe where I was teaching. For the 22nd year that I've been over there teaching at this event in Germany. Um, you know, life in Orlando. Mostly what my life about here is um, taking care of my elderly mother. I am her primary caretaker. And, um, and then I do what work is available to me in addition to that. In, you know, in my field if it can be, so designing software, computer systems and things, or doing people's websites and such. But um, mostly my life is about dealing with family, taking care of family. And uh, what, what did your family do? What was your, did your mother work? Um, my father was an electrical engineer. Um, they had seven children. I'm fifth of seven. And uh, so my mother was basically a stay-at-home mom for a lot of that, and then didn't start really working until I was about 16 um, in Maryland. And then, <laughs> go away and don't do that again. <laughs> I'll make that stop. Should have thought of that first. Oh, that's all right. The only person who can make my phone ring now is my mother. <laughs> okay. um, my father was an electrical engineer. He did a wide variety of things, first with Martin Mayer, well, actually in Chicago. We moved down here for a job at Martin, which was before it was Lockheed Martin. And then um, up to Maryland, hated it, cold weather, not an interesting job for him. Came back to Florida at Harris Corporation, where they got involved with the satellite project. Um, and then eventually ended up with TRW Space and Defense and retired from them. Um, I worked with TRW Space and Defense, was my first real job in my industry. And then um, that, on the same project as my father, which was an extraordinary privilege. My father was brilliant and exceedingly humble, um, but just this brilliant man. 
And I had the privilege of spending five years working with him and just you know, being around that mind every day and seeing how he viewed the world, which was fascinating because growing up, I didn't experience my parents quite that way. Um, I grew up in a household where debate was a normal form of communication, <laughs> you know, and I never knew what my parents thought about anything because if one of them would say something, the other one would automatically take the opposite position. And so what did, you know, what did either of them actually believe about the world was almost impossible for me to determine. And, um, you know, in that time period, and I actually got to learn about my father. And one of the things that I learned is that he wasn't ashamed of me because growing up he never spoke to me. Um, and I, I didn't know why. It turned out he didn't speak to me because he was partially deaf and he couldn't hear me. So when my voice really changed, then he could hear me. You know, alone, the two of us, he could hear me. And I walked into, he worked in a trailer in the desert. And I walked into his office one day for some reason. And on the wall was a framed poster of a dance exhibition that I had done when I was at Rollins. And I went home and I said to my mother, did you know that dad has the poster from Rollins on the wall in the office? And she said, oh yes, your father's very proud of you. And up until that very moment, what I had assumed was that he was embarrassed about me because I was a dancer and you know, not like his other sons. And that really, that wasn't true. So, you know, that was just, it was remarkable. And, you know, in an era when being gay was not okay, you know, having a security clearance and being gay was not okay, um, it was a very hard thing to do. Um, and, you know, my parents are very Catholic, uh, you know, like, know the Pope kind of Catholic. Um, there's a photograph of my mother with John Paul II, just the two of them. So it was a, you know, yeah, it was not okay. And yet, there this poster was. It was an incredible experience. Um, but no, when I came back to Orlando, I continued to dance, and I had gotten involved with same-sex ballroom dancing. You know, two men dancing together, two women dancing together, which again, two women dancing together has always been socially acceptable, two men dancing together is not. And so, um, you know, I had a partner here in Orlando, we trained, we worked hard, we eventually won world titles together. And then he quit. And I didn't have anything to do. So I had heard the chorus sing, and I thought, I can try this. I don't sing, but I can try this. You know, I was in chorus in seventh and eighth grade, but um, I didn't get a good grade. And when I asked the teacher why, she told me I didn't have a good voice. And so I quit singing, and I never sang again. I mean, I wouldn't sing happy birthday to people for 35 years. So I joined the chorus, and then you know, started singing with them, and it was fun. It was, I didn't have to be good. There were zero <laughs> expectations that I actually be good at anything. Not like work, not like dancing. You know, just show up, sing, have a good time. And, you know, as it happens, apparently I've gotten to the point where I'm okay as a singer. And, you know, had the, the privilege of being a part of the chorus now for six years. And it's really, it is, it's a lot of fun, a wonderful thing. It's fantastic. Um, so uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got involved in uh, ballroom and Latin dancing? Um, what sort of work um, did you do as a board member? On the, I saw that you did the um, North American Same-Sex Partner Dance Association. You Googled me. I Googled. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, my parents were square dancers. They had taken a square dance class here in Orlando. And they had what was called a hoedown, which was in the parking lot of the uh, um, uh, Colonial Plaza Mall, in where what now would be the, I guess, the Walgreens or the CBS is in that corner. That was parking. They put up a tent one day, and they just had the square dance collar come with a whole bunch of people, and people were dancing in the parking lot. And I saw the Orlando Cloggers perform, and that's what I wanted to do. I wasn't quite old enough yet. I had to be 10, and I wasn't 10 yet. And so as soon as I turned 10, then I could start the classes. And it was amazing. It was run by the city. It was $5 per family for the season. 
not five dollars a week, not five dollars a person. It was five dollars for the entire thing for three of us to go and take the classes. And I loved it. I thought it was awesome. I loved the dancing. So, you know, I learned to clog, I learned to square dance, and then I learned the round dancing, which was like ballroom. And um, we moved to Maryland when I was in high school, and I could dance. And I got a job at an independent ballroom dancing studio as a dance teacher at the age of 16. I, and this is 1970. Five, seven, five, seventy-six, and I was making sixteen dollars an hour, which is basically still what a, a beginning dance instructor makes. Same, same thing. But I was making sixteen dollars an hour teaching dance lessons, and I think the minimum wage was two eighty-five. <laughs> so it's like, woohoo! I had money. It's like I'm sixteen years old. I've got this job that I, can, that I love, and I have money. It was amazing, and and I love the dancing. Um, when I developed arthritis, and you know, what they told me was I would never walk again. I was 100% disabled. And that was while I was here at UCF. You know, the campus was not that big as it is now, but I couldn't walk across campus. And the medication had this profound effect on me. I, I couldn't communicate. Um, you know, I couldn't write coherently. I couldn't make sense of what I was reading. And I could, I could not talk intelligently. And fortunately, there was a professor here in the computer science department who understood what was going on. And she advised me to you know, get the medical records brought in and, and have my record expunged and sealed so that all of that failing grade stuff that showed up because of that would not show up on my transcript ever. And without that, I would have simply just failed out of graduate school and probably never been able to get back in and then, you know, got enough better that I could move and get back into school and get a job that was uh, that I loved. Um, and tried to dance, you know, as best I could. And it wasn't always easy physically. I was, I was allergic to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And so any of them that I would take would cause some kind of a very unpleasant neurological side effect. So it was better to just be in pain. So basically for 30 years, I just lived in pain and didn't tell anybody, didn't talk about it. Um, you know, if it was a bad day, you just try to dance with your partner, not touching, actually. You know, so just, and don't say, don't, never tell anybody why you can't do anything, you know. Um, yeah, it's really horrible. Um, pretending. You know, pretending about a lot of things, pretending about being okay, pretending about not being gay, pretending about, you know, that my brain was working normally when it wasn't. Basically, life was a whole lot about pretending a lot of things. And very painful. Physically, psychologically, emotionally painful. To live that way all the time. But yeah, I got, you know, I danced as much as I could, and slowly, slowly over time. Basically, most dancers peak in their late 20s or early 30s. It's like, mm, yeah, not until I was in my late 40s. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, did what teaching I could over the years. I mean, I've been traveling to Europe for over 20 years and teaching there, um, uh, various places around the United States, Canada, Japan. Uh, we did, a couple years ago, we did a three-week tour in Japan, six different teaching events while we were there. It's just amazing. Which in and of itself was fascinating because, you know, there's a large community of dancers in Japan. And they knew of me and they, they would, when they would come to the United States, they would always be at the events that I was at. Um, and they brought people over all the time. To teach, and I asked. It was a big, big international convention that I was teaching at. There was a huge group of Japanese there, and I got invited to the room party with the Japanese. Was the only white person at this party, and um, so I asked. And it's like, you know, when will I get invited to Japan? 
and this, there was this discussion, this rapid discussion in Japanese, and the woman who spoke English best took me into the, the bathroom in the connected hotel rooms and closed the door and said to me, we cannot invite you. I was like, well, why? And she goes, because whoever invites you would have to accept your shame. I was like, oh. So when I got contacted a couple years ago about coming over, it was an American woman living in Japan. I didn't know her history, but she was an American woman living in Japan with the dancing. And so I wrote to her and said, I'd love to come, but you know, you need to know. And she said to me, oh, that's not how it is now. Things changed. Things changed because finally the Japanese government had to acknowledge that there were people in Japan dying of AIDS. And so everything changed when they acknowledged that, that these are Japanese people, therefore they're Japanese. And the laws changed and the way that people behave changed and now it was just not a problem. And this was like you know, social change on this huge scale in a couple of years. You know, things that we have been fighting for in this country for 20 or 30 years and still don't have that they could achieve because as a society it's more important that you're Japanese than it is that you're gay. Now, so she arranged this trip, we went, we had this amazing time and it didn't matter at all. You know, it didn't matter at all. It matters more here than it does there. No, I mean, I'm, and I still, I love dancing, although at this point I'm probably done. I don't have a partner anymore. And if I can't dance on a regular basis, then I lose the ability to dance, which anybody would. Any skill that you've developed, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's, you know, especially physical skills. But in my case, it's not just that. Dancing's what's kept me well. Um, if I don't move, I can't move. And I've tried other things. I've you know, gone to gyms, I've done swimming, I've done all kinds of things. The only thing that's been really effective is the dancing that I do. And so basically, you know, 47 years of dancing, and I don't have a partner. If I don't have a partner, I can't dance. If I can't dance, I don't know how long it is that I can walk. That's the equation. I mean, I talk, I, walking over here from the parking garage was an ordeal. And that's been, you know, it's four, four months that I haven't danced regularly. Going to Germany and having to dance all day, every day. It was like the first day was just horrible. And after that, then it's like, oh, I'm dancing. My body is happy. And it's fine. So I get distracted easily. It's okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm chatting. Um, I was going to have a question following up on that is, um, what kind of, did you face any sort of challenges um, early on um, in a same-sex partner dance organization? Like, what did you... Oh, you were asked about NAFTA. That was not the first. Mm -hmm. um, the first organization kind of disappeared. There was the United States same-sex dance uh, organization that I was one of the founders of. I was also... A, a, an honorary founding member of the European same-sex dance organization. And then at the same time that those two were formed, there was a world organization that was formed. And I was on the committee that helped form it, write the bylaws, was an officer of it. And then there was a dispute about, you know, was that the right way to do this? Did it happen too fast? All that. So that organization shut down. The North American one disappeared. And a couple of years later, the um, or the U.S. one disappeared. Then they, they decided to do try again, and we created the North American Same Sex Partner Dance Association (NASPDA). And I was again one of the founders, uh, original co co president with a woman, um, Barbara Zoloff, was one one of my students for many years. And um, you know, then actually I was the first honorary member of the organization when I went off the board. Me in. And, uh, you know, so I, I've been involved in the history of same sex dancing in the United States since essentially its beginning. Um, I ran the first, uh, well, not the first, the first same sex dance competition was a long time ago in New York, the first one we know of. But it was a one time thing. And then nothing happened for years and years. But I put one together with um, my partner that I went to the gay games in 1998 with, Tom Slater. 
and a woman, a straight woman, that was helping us, Ava K. And, um, and the three of us decided this was important, and we put together, um, it was, I think it was March Madness, might have been the first one. It was either March Madness or April Follies. And then the next one, you know, we did series of them that, that I ran with the two of them for many years. Starting around 2000, 2001. And then when I moved away, I ran the next year remotely, you know, went back for it. Then it was too much. So I turned it over to this organization, a nonprofit in the Bay Area, that has run it ever since. And so it's the longest running same sex uh, dance competition in North America. And longer than many of the ones in Europe. Um, and uh, so there's a you know, very small community of people involved in that in this country. We don't have a history of partner dancing in this country in the way they do in Europe and other places in the world. But there are people that are really love it. It's this wonderful thing to do. It's social, it's engaging, it challenges the mind and the body. Um, it's great exercise in a gentle way. And it's fun. It's just a tremendous amount of fun. Um, competing in the same-sex world is so different than the mainstream world. The mainstream world is very cutthroat. And the same-sex world, is, you know, the, the, the people who've been to mainstream competition that come to a, one of the same-sex events, it's like, what? It's like, it's, you act like you like each other. You know, this isn't like a competition. It's like a party. It's a celebration. I and mean, that's exactly what it feels like. We are celebrating something that we can't have. I mean, there were rules against same-sex couples competing uh, in regular competitions. Some of that has changed now. But there were rules against it that you weren't allowed. You know, and it's not just that you, you know, could if you wanted to, but you, you weren't allowed. And while I wasn't directly involved in a lot of the politics in the mainstream world to do that, I was behind the people who were. You know, I wasn't. They hated me in the mainstream world of ballroom dancing from day one because I was an out gay man doing ballroom dancing, and there were none. It was like, you, you can't do that. I got told when I was trying to compete as an amateur and then as a professional, you, you can't be out. You, can, you have to stop talking about this. You can't bring a boyfriend. I was like, yeah. No, I don't, I, I don't need you to dance. I don't do this for a living. You can't make me. And so, oh, they did not like me. <laughs> I mean, when I was still trying to be an amateur, there were actually lawsuits filed against me, trying to keep me from dancing, I'm trying to, you know, declare me not an amateur. I was, I had a sports lawyer. That was, I, mean, I finally quit. I was spending about five thousand dollars a year defending my amateur status with the lawyer. I was like, this is ridiculous. This thing's already so expensive. I was spending twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a year dancing, and on top of that, I got to spend lawyers' fees. Nobody else has to do this, so I just I gave up. I let them make me go pro. And then you know, dance in Europe more than the United States because in Europe, nobody knows who I am. They don't care. Then you get judged on the dancing. But, you know, it's, you know this thing that I'm passionate about. I just love doing it. I love teaching. I love dancing. You know, the, um, the next World Championships for same-sex dancing is going to be in Miami in August of 2017 at the, uh, the World Out Games. And I won't be dancing. You know, I've, I've danced at every gay game since 1998. I'm the only one. The gay games in 1998 was the first time they had dancing. And my partner and I took third. We danced in Sydney, and then, let's see, it was uh, Amsterdam, Sydney, I want to say Chicago, Cologne, Cleveland. The next one's Paris, the 18. And, uh, and then the out games. We danced in Montreal for the first one. We didn't go to the next ones. And then, um, and that would be Miami. Like, I don't have a partner. I don't get to dance. It's like a four-hour drive from where I live, and I won't be dancing. It's just so miserable. I don't have a partner. And it's something, you can't do it alone. And it's really, you know, it's hard to reflect on that 47 years is coming to an end. 
and I don't have a say in that. It's just gonna happen. Well, let me see. I, I, you already discussed. Uh, I saw that you had a you overcame rheumatoid arthritis actually in a profile I was reading online. Oh, um, it was the one in the Orlando Sentinel. I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the picture of me and the dog. That's right. Then yes. that was the one. Um, oh, we'll I also saw there that you did. Um, you were a technical consultant on the rewrite of a DBIDA American Smooth Bronze Syllabus Manual. Oh could, yeah. Did you explain what that is and describe the work you did on that? Um, Davida is uh, oh. Dance Vision, D, Dance Vision International, DIDA. Um, Dance Vision International is the company, DA, I don't remember what it stands for. A friend of mine, um, Diane Jarmelo, that I used to coach and have known forever. Um, she got, she contacted me about helping with the manual, which was very nice, it was great, it was really lovely to be asked, but I'm very technical, people know that I have this profound, very deep understanding of dancing, which happened while I lived in New Mexico. Um, I couldn't dance much. It was, you know, a 60-mile drive to the closest dance studio, which I would do. There was a, a woman there that did some dancing that I could do, but we were only allowed to dance after the studio closed at night because the owner didn't want people seeing us because we didn't fit the profile. She was a teacher there, and he was afraid that we would scare people off. You know, it's like wrong level, wrong kind of dancing for what the studio was about. And so two weeknights a week, I would drive to El Paso, be there at 10 o'clock at night, and dance till midnight, and drive home, and have to be at work at 7 in the morning. Um, but um, while I was there, I met this woman who did ballet, and her husband, fiance, was a PhD kinesiologist at New Mexico State University, and he wanted a project. But, you know, at the time, this was when they were doing a lot of things with, you know, analyzing on videotape athletic performance. So they were looking at, you know, runners on treadmills or swimmers in flow tanks or cyclists on stationary bicycles and seeing, you know, how do you optimize the human body in motion. And he didn't want to do any of that stuff. So what I did was taught his, his fiancé how to ballroom dance while he analyzed what we were doing which basically no one had ever done before. No one had ever looked at the, the, the actual human body while it was dancing in this way. And not just one body, but two, how two bodies work together. And he did this analysis of it with, with knowing nothing about dancing. So all of the language of dancing that had been used for 80, 90 years to teach it had nothing to do with what he wrote about or what he analyzed. So not, here's what somebody has always said about what we're doing, but this is what the bodies are doing. And I, so he wrote about that, and then I got all that information, and then I had that. And so I could write about dancing in, in the dance world. And I wrote papers that would get published about, here's why the feet do what they do, here's the way that your hold actually works in the frame. You know, not what Patrick Swayze says about it in Dirty Dancing but what's actually going on. And that kind of revolutionized the way the dancing was looked at all over the world. And my, my work got spread all over. Um, and so because of that, I became well known for this level of technical understanding. And when Diane needed help with the new manuals they were writing, then I got an email, it's like, you're willing. I was like, yes. <laughs> I've been waiting for this. <laughs> Fix this stuff, because it's wrong. <laughs> And so, yeah, I worked on those manuals. And in fact, my former partner is now working on the new set. He's up in uh, Indiana. And he was actually just out here for three days to talk to me about it, because he's actually, he's now the consultant for the next set of stuff that's being done. Um, but yeah, I got a credit in the, in the, in the book and everything. And it's like technical consultant. And it was all this weird stuff. What's the difference between brush to and brush toward? What's the difference between a brush and a collect? You know, it's like, how did, What's the difference between side and slightly forward and forward and slightly side? And it's like all this really technical stuff, which I'm well suited to because I love language. You know, for my own issues with language, couldn't speak for a long time, love language. I'm a mathematician, so you know, I had a double major at Rollins, mathematics and English. And the dancing is mathematical. 
the partner dancing is a is a mathematical construct actually. And then I had all this understanding of what was going on because of this analysis that had been done by this PhD kinesiologist. It's like, yeah, it's perfect. Love it. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> so um, could you tell us, uh, so you joined the uh, gay course, you talked a little bit how you got involved. Um, do you have a favorite production that you did that you can recall? Um, no. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's funny. I don't have a sticky memory for lyrics. Lyrics are so hard for me to learn. They don't stick in my brain very well. And uh, so, you know, people would say, oh, we sang this five years, and they're going, really? really? I was here then, didn't we? I don't remember. Um, but I, I love singing with the chorus. I, I have no interest in doing any of the solo stuff or anything. I have zero. I love singing with the chorus. And we do two major concerts a year, the spring and the holiday. Um, I like the spring concerts, but I tend to love the holiday stuff because the music is different. You know, the, the Christmas stuff, the holiday stuff in general, it's just got this wonderful character. And uh, learning, learning about music. I mean, I always had to know something about music because of dancing. I played piano for several years, and I, that was the first thing I didn't understand at the time, but it hurt. It got to the point where it hurt, and so I quit. And then I was a great believer in I'm young and healthy, park across campus and walk. And uh, at Rollins, I was in the math program. The math courses were on the fourth floor of the Bush Science Center. I always took the stairs, and it got to the point where I couldn't climb the stairs, so I didn't know what was going on. Um, but, you know, how did I get involved with the course? My partner quit. And I thought, wow, I won't be dancing. I need something to do that's interesting, that will challenge my mind, that will be fun, that will get me out in the world. Because I don't have a regular job. I don't meet people. I don't, you know, have people at work. I don't go out to lunch. I don't meet people. So I'll join the chorus. It'll be fun. And it has been. It's really lovely. Um, but. And I was afraid to sing, because I hadn't. I'd been told I didn't sing well. Well, they didn't care. You know, now it's a little different. The, the chorus actually has improved dramatically from then. Oh, you know, the work of Jim Brown here at UCF was our director at the time that I joined, and he did great work with the chorus. And now we have a new director who's very, very choral, very, you know, the sound is going to be the sound kind of thing. And uh, I don't know that I could get in now. You know, if I had, if I tried to join. Now I doubt that they would take me. Now I'm okay. I mean, I've learned. But you know, between the two of them, I learned a lot. Understanding the music that's fundamentally different. And I love that. I love learning. And then being with the group and doing. So, you know, particular thing that we sing that I like the best? No, no. I mean, every concert there's something that I end up really loving, which is usually a surprise. It's not the thing that I think at the first that I'm going to like. And you know, something that's not my favorite. You know, sing it anyway. Um, and most of the stuff is like, oh, this is fun or not. You know. Some things are more fun to sing. Some things just the sound of them. We did, um, in the last concert, before we went to Denver for Gala, one of the things we sang was a song for, a prayer for children. And it's an old piece. It was written, um, I think, about Croatia during the war there. And it's gorgeous. It's hard, but it's so beautiful. Um, when I first joined, it was like I had to be surrounded by other people singing my part. And so it was, you know, it's like, oh, I can't stand next to somebody who's doing anything different than me and don't sing that well. And now, normally where I get placed is standing next to the altos. I sing bass, I sing low bass. So it's like bass baritone. We usually sing the same thing, but not always. And then the altos. And so I'm standing next to an alto and in the front, and I can hear the rest of the chorus. And it's so beautiful sometimes, one of these pieces that we do. The fun stuff I love, it's great fun to sing. But this, I love the things that the sound of them is, it's amazing to experience. 
And that's what I've always looked for in the dance music. You know, the sound of the music that I choose for my own choreography is you know, what I'm interested in. But yeah, chorus is great. It's, it's always been interesting to belong. You know, there's, like any other human endeavor and organization, there's groups that form and factions and the politics of it and all of that. It's normal. I'm used to that. But at the heart of it, there's this thing that we're doing something that matters as a group. Um, when the course was formed 26 years ago, you know, the, the small group of people that did that, they were risking you know, employment you know, to be associated with a gay group publicly like that. Many of them could have been fired for it. Um, it was a brave thing to do then. Um, and you know, it's not like that now. You belong. It's okay in Orlando. But you know, this summer has been kind of insane. We had had our concert and the the weekend of the shooting at Pulse, there were several things going on. Um, every year right around that time there's the Orange Blossom Festival which is a big country and western dance competition. And I always try to go. Um, at least one night, go by, dance, and visit with people, because I know a lot of people. And it's like convention friends. You see them once a year. And Because I don't go to the other stuff, and I'm not a country and western dancer. But some of these people do other things. Some of them are involved in the same-sex ballroom. Um, and it's often my birthday, because my birthday is June 11th. And so, Normally what would happen is I would go on the Saturday, it's the better night. If you go on Friday, people don't stay up that late, because a lot of them have to get up in the morning and compete, dance with their students, or dance some way. And Saturday's better. A lot of the competition is over, the stuff on Sunday is different. And so, you know, go there, dance all evening around midnight or so, get a group of people, and we'll go out. Go someplace where there is music. Um, and music that you can dance to, partner dance to. And that has, in fact, been Pulse in the past. Uh, when it matched up, Latin night, if it was going on, we could go there and dance. That would be great. Um, this year, I went on Friday, because Saturday night, we had one of our uh, non-outreach, there's another word. I forget this word every time I go to do it. Uh, cabaret. We have three cabaret performances a year. One of them's at the Parliament House. It's called Uncut. It's the raunchy one. And then we have the the, uh, the February Valentine's Day one, that's the love one, and then the, the summer one. And this year it was early in the summer, it was often later. And, um, and I happened to be on that Saturday, and since it was my birthday weekend, I wasn't singing it. It was like, I'll go. And they had this VIP tickets with the reception and the dinner and then the thing, and I was like, I'll go to that. So I had the ticket and I went, it was wonderful, I had a great time, and then it was done, and Nobody wanted to really go out, and I did not want to drive all the way out to this hotel and see what's going on. It was late. Any other year, I would have been at the hotel with the dancers, and we would have been going to Pulse and arriving about 12.30 and staying until they closed, or later, make them stay open and play music. So I would have had, you know, 25, 30 people from out of town you just love to dance. Be there with me. And then just, you know, when I'm tired, I think I'll go home. That was the decision. So Sunday morning, I wake up, I look at my phone, and there's all these text messages, are you okay, are you okay? And I'm thinking, it was one singer, Yes, I know we sing at the plaza. You know, people know we sing at the plaza. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then I get into the shower and turn on the radio. <laughs> it's like, turn off the shower, go back to the phone. It's like, oh my God. I had no idea. And I'm listening to the news. And I was like, wow. You know, but for being tired. bringing people.
No, I don't. I'm not a Facebook person, really. But I looked to see. And I saw that there was going to be a special mass. The, um, there's a gay Catholic group in Orlando. And the priest who runs that uh, used to sing the chorus with us. And so I take my mother to Mass every Sunday, very Catholic, in Winter Park, St. Margaret Mary, very affluent. And, you know, I got to Mass and I was waiting to see would they say anything. And they, and they did. Um, it wasn't hugely specific, but it was, you know, they acknowledged what had happened in the violence. Not that it was a gay attack or anything, but, but at least they acknowledged it at Mass. And we left immediately from there and went to the, to the place, which is a bar, you know, St. Matthew's. It used to be, I want to say, Revolution on Mills, right. next to the center. Right. That's where they have Mass. And so we went. And, you know, we, we went to Mass there. And you know, at some point in the afternoon, there was a message that came out about we had been invited to sing at um, Joy MCC. I was like, absolutely. I'll be there. It was massive. I'm going to show up, and there's all these cameras, and they have relegated them to this corner in the back, and there's way too many people, and there's some seating reserved in the front for the chorus, and it's not enough. There's so many of us that showed up. And I felt terrible. I had to sit because I, I couldn't stand. My hip hurt. My knee hurt. But I couldn't. I couldn't stand for the whole thing. I had to take a chair away from somebody else, you know. But and then it came time to sing. So we lined up in the front, and um, we had true colors and. You'll never walk alone. And we sang. And, um, by the time I got home, you know, looked at Facebook, and there was a video that had been posted. It was CBS News. And the CBS Newsman thought he was so clever, he had gotten the camera spot that was right in the center aisle. And so when we went to do True Colors, of course, that's where the conductor stood. And right in front of him was the soloist. Caitlin. And so he had a completely blocked view <laughs> of the soloist. You couldn't get her face. Couldn't get her face. But there is the camera, and there am I. And out of this like two and a half minute video, about 60 seconds of it is on my face. And this got posted on Facebook and re tagged and posted and posted. And by the time I got home, I had messages from 11 countries. And it was overwhelming. I mean, you know, we didn't know a lot yet. We didn't even know really how many people were dead yet. We didn't know whether or not I knew anybody. Nobody well, no close friends. But it's a small community. You know, you don't know what to do. And what there was to do? Sing. As it happens, I don't have a day job. So, when we get asked to go and sing, and I can say yes. 
I can show up at one o'clock at UCF across town for something, or drive up to the convention center and crack of dawn and not worry about being late to work, or I could show up. That's what I could do. And it was fascinating to see. We had the Sunday night there, and then Monday night at Dr. Phillips on the lawn, which was not supposed to be what it was, but turned into this thing. And, and it just started happening. And we had Gala coming, we knew. And that was going to change. Everything was going to change. So we got invited to be, to sing at the formal thing at Dr. Phillips on the 28th. I was flying out. I was going early. I have an ex-boyfriend that lives in Denver. And four years ago, I got to visit with him. This year I was going to do the same. Go early, spend some time with him, meet the husband, you know, of 11 years that I had never met. Um, and so I wasn't, I wasn't at the first concert at Dr. Phillips inside. I had a few days. I mean, there had been so many things. I think Carol said that between June 20th, the 12th and the 28th, there were 20 outreach things that we did. And I lost count how many I did. And, you know, some of them were just the ensemble things and one or two people, but, but you know, 20 things that the chorus was involved in, uh, like at least nine that I did in those few days. And I got to Denver, and I had time away from all of them. You know, there was no longer on the news every day, and not what everybody's talking about. Just time. Processing. It was like, oh, this is what that means. Time to really think, to, to stop and feel. And then Gail would come, and I knew, I knew what it was going to be like. I mean, Gail was crazy anyway, and it was going to be different. We were going to, you know. Kind of like, if you're going to be a part of this, you accept an obligation about certain things. I'm used to, I'm used to being a public figure. I'm, I'm, a, I'm well known in the world of dancing, in the world of same-sex dancing. I'm the grandfather. I'm known. Um, I was well known in my work in California. You talk about but I've, I've done things that people don't understand. You know, I worked on, when you type on the computer and it offers you the corrected spelling or look ahead, I developed that for the very first system that ever had it was the, the satellite control system that I did for NASA in the 80s. That did become available for a very, very long time. But I developed the very first clickable interface to purchase online shopping is what we call it now. I developed that. The, the idea that you can get credit by filling out an online form, that was revolutionary. I did that. I designed that. Um, that when you go to an ATM and you put in your money or your check, and it just reads it and tells you, instead of putting that in an envelope and writing on the envelope, and a person has to open it and count it. I did that. Not, not for ATMs. Didn't fit in an ATM when I did it. But that technology was something I developed. That's what I worked on. I've done all these things with computers that have transformed the world as we know it. 
and that are now a part of everybody's existence in the Western world and how we just interact all the time. And my name is not on any of it. I have no patents, I'm not famous for any of it, but the people who were there, they all knew. Now, I walked into a room of computer nerds in the Bay Area and everybody knew who I was. I was the guy that had won a congressional award for software. There wasn't anybody else that had done that, and never has been. You know, I was the guy that walked up to Steve Jobs and told him he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he was not happy with me. And I know what it's like to be public. And what the chorus was facing was, we were going to be the face of Orlando, the face of Paul's, at this huge thing. When somebody comes walking up and they have to say something to you, or they have to express how they feel, the obligation is listen. Let them. Let them feel what they feel. Let them share what they have to say. Because at that point it's no longer about us. People need the space to be able to express, to, to grieve, to process. And we were going to be their outlet for doing that. James was not exactly the kind of director that was used to talking a lot, especially in a performance. The first time he was involved with the performance of the chorus, we sang. He probably said six words to the audience. Not his thing. We were in the waiting area backstage. And he spoke to us. We had this set of songs, carefully chosen, changed from what it was supposed to be. I mean, we had, our, our set for Gala was celebratory when we started. Had to change. The message had to change. And some of the music was not music that people wanted to necessarily be singing. Um, but it told a story. And he talked to us. We have an obligation. Find a connection to that music. Relay the message that we're bringing. It's hard. You know, there's suffering, there's pain, there's hope. It's up to us. Create hope, create love. Like it was beautiful. So we walk on stage and we start to sing. I mean, if we didn't get to the The ovation. And you know, you just have to stand there and take it. I used to teach people. You just got to stand there and take it. I made my staff learn to be acknowledged. It's not easy all the time. It's not easy. And what did we do? We have to live in Orlando and say, it causes me. And then James read his statement to the audience. None of us had a clue what it said. And then, I mean, God. The man's eloquent. You know, he's a school teacher, he's educated, he knows how to write. It was good. It was devastating. I was like, and then that sing. It's like, oh no, I'll be kidding. It's like, it's like, But you know, at that point, it didn't matter. We stood there and flapped our arms like birds, and nobody would care. That's not one. But we tried. I mean, by the second verse, that was you'll never walk alone. By the second verse, we could maybe sort of say. And the walk out. 
into that crowd. I remember being in Washington, D.C. mid-90s, like the second march on Washington. Being on the subway, when I lived in the Bay Area, you know, one of gay centrals, it's like, no. You know, when you ride on BART, you're not safe. Doesn't matter that it's San Francisco. No. You, you, it, there's a way of being circumspect. I spent my whole childhood being abused because I was different. I didn't understand that different men gay, but they did. Uh, you know, I, it was a normal part of my experience to be physically attacked on a regular basis. Thrown into lockers, you know, punched and hit. And that was just normal, and there was no adults who were in care. My mother asked me the other day, like, where, where, was I affectionate as a mother? And I said, not to me. And she was shocked. She's like, it's like, I'm the wrong one to ask. I didn't let anyone touch me. From, from the dead first day of first grade, new school, you know, didn't know anybody, new city. And the first thing that happened to me was to be attacked. Yeah, I didn't let people touch me. Dancing was my way of touch. Other than that, no one touched me. I hugged people, barely would shake hands. Not allowed to touch. And you walk out to this, would you hug you? I'm not good at hugging. I had scheduled my flights that I would actually not stay to the very end. I was so grateful. I couldn't take it anymore. In Gala, they have coffee concerts in the morning. They, uh, a larger time slot to do something special with a very small Canadian group. <clears throat> it was very crowded. I managed to get a seat. And it was marvelous. It was funny. Almost every one of the choruses added something in it to acknowledge. You know, it was very... Uh, I don't want to seem callous, but it was like... You know, one more thanks. But... And the Canadians changed their program too a little bit. But what was fascinating to me was they had this woman in a hajib singing with them. She was fascinating. Soaring soprano voice, phenomenally animated. Just, you know, capture everyone's eye when she was on stage. And they, they sang a song in, um, not Farsi, but um, Arabic because of her. And, you know, it's normal. You know, people were leaving the stage and line the hallways and everybody comes in and everybody would think. So I just waited, I waited, I waited. We had, we had, uh, you know, people had ribbons that we had made and stickers and the Pulse logos and those things. So, and I wanted to talk to this woman. And everybody wanted to talk to this woman. She had friends there and all this, and I waited. And finally, Finally, there was a camera crew following her. And I just waited until she was kind of done and it all settled down. And she saw me in the shirt, the shirt. And she looked at me and I looked at her. And I put out my hand and had one of the post stickers in it. And I said to her, I want you to have this. This is extraordinary. Here's this woman who turns out isn't a woman. See, she's a transsexual in process. 
who is a convert to Islam, who decided to be Orthodox, found an organization in Canada that would accept her for who she is. You know, coming to America, to a major city, after a shooting that's related to, you know, an Islamic fundamentalist, supposedly, not really, but that's the perception. And, and so we stood there, we talked, I don't know, 20 minutes. It was amazing. And, you know, the stories that she had to tell, just, this is, this is what bravery looks like. It's like, let's get the picture, you know. Out of two pictures. I always forget. And I have my picture with her. You put it on Facebook, it's mine. There were, there's been a lot of things. One of the outreaches was at um, Kennedy Space Center. And not many people could go. It's like work day, Tuesday, all day. You have to be able to get on base. Not everybody would pass the minimal clearance requirements. Um, but I could go. And um, I was like, oh, this will be interesting. You know, I wonder if anybody will know my project. That was, it was, and you know, when I worked with TRW Space and Defense, being gay was not a good thing. Uh, and here we show up, and it's going to be this auditorium full of people who, because they have an organization. It's like NASA has an organization for gay people. Different world. And, and yes, you know, people know the project. Still a meaningful thing. People actually, you know, people who know my father's name. It was amazing. And that was hard. That was for me, that was the hardest one to see there. There's still. I just, we just went Sunday to the movie theater because Tony Romero, what is his name, invited the chorus and a few other people because Alan gave him a showing of Finding Dory, which I did not see. And I was like, okay, this is lovely, get to go. It's changing. We get to reflect differently to look to a future. The obligation to create something meaningful is on those who survive, who are after. It's like funerals aren't for the dead, they're for the living. We're living. We get to choose what this means. We get to choose what happens. I want, I want there to be a difference. I want the world to wake up and know. I don't want it to be because it was a gay club in Orlando, but something has to do it. You know, you take the populations of Great Britain, Australia, Denmark, and Sweden, you know, several other countries combined is less than the population of the United States. And we have, you know, up 50 times the murder rate that they do. It's not just because we're stupid. It's because they have gun laws that are meaningful, and we don't. You know, a 
Australia had a mass shooting and they changed their world. It was insane. We're insane. We're living in an insane society. I want sanity. I'm tired of it costing lives. I'll look forward to my birthday next year. Because it's going to be, you know, the weekend of the one year anniversary. I don't want there to be a one year anniversary. There will be. I'll be there. We have to be responsible for what happens next. I have to be responsible for what happens next. <clears throat> well, I what sort of uh, what would you hope the long-term consequences will be for the Orlando gay community and really just for the city, the larger city, or just maybe even society from this? You know, it was interesting. Um, after this, it's like you drive around town and there's rainbow lights everywhere. Like, you know, it was obvious. My brother was in town for the weekend the day with his wife, they live in Melbourne, and we were going to go to brunch up in Longwood, driving and getting off at the exit of I-4, and it was raining, and, it was, and below it is the banner, Orlando United, with the rainbow flag, it was a green I took a picture out of the window of the car, and we got to the restaurant and, you know, had this wonderful brunch, and leaving the restaurant, they have one of those chalkboard things, you know, two-sided. And on the front side, walking in, is all the specials, and on the back side was the Orlando Strong, Orlando United. But, you know, I don't, where was I? The Longwood, somewhere, Castleberry, and there's the CVS with the electronic sign out front that cycles through its set of stuff, one of which was Orlando Strong. I think it would be beautiful if what would just happen is that we could be the city of rainbows. Let's, you know, that somehow the gay community got the rainbow flag. It's like, wow, that was smart. <laughs> I don't know if they were actually planning that far in advance, but it's like, wow, we co-opted the rainbow. <laughs> it's like, that's awesome. The city beautiful, the city of rainbows. Wow, I would I would love for all of these city buildings and, and banks and everything else. It's like keep putting up rainbows. They're beautiful. We can create all the meaning we want for them. They're beautiful. That would be a wonderful thing to have happen. Um, I would I want gun control that makes sense. I don't know if we're going to get it. I don't know how we're going to get it because we our society is literally insane. But I would like that to be an outcome. I would like that, you know, we have this political season that we're dealing with. We're dealing with the rise of fundamentalism. People don't understand what that means. Fundamentalism is a particular thing in philosophy. It's, it's not just an extreme point of view. That's orthodoxy. It's not just that I'm right and you're wrong. 
is I'm right, you're wrong, and the existence of other ideas, other beliefs, cannot be tolerated and must be suppressed or eliminated by whatever means necessary. That's fundamentalism. We've seen it in religions, not just Islam. I mean, you know, American Christianity is full of its fundamentalism. You will believe the way that I say it's supposed to be, or, and when you, you know, political fundamentalism, I'll get what I want in this bill, or this bill will never happen. There is no such thing as compromise in fundamentalism. Nationalism is a form of fundamentalism. Brexit is fundamentalism. The rise of these nationalistic parties in Europe, that's fundamentalism. You know, even the idea that the news doesn't tell us the facts, they tell us how we're supposed to feel about what happens. No. You don't get to tell me how to feel. But somehow that's become part of news. No. But that's representative of fundamentalism. It's you don't get to have your opinion. There is the opinion, and that's it. As long as that's true, we're not going to see gun control. We're not going to see a society where it's truly safe to be gay. We've made huge progress, but that doesn't change the way that people think. Or belief. Belief is worse. Belief takes no foundation. It doesn't have to be proved. And anything that stands in the way of it can be discounted. We sing, you know, you know, we talk about the, what is our purpose. We're going to change hearts and minds for musical excellence. The opportunity that's been presented to the Orlando Gay Chorus because of this horrific thing is phenomenal. We get an audience that we would never have had. And we get to stand up and we get to sing and we get to do it as a gay group. And people get to hear good music. Good singing. And it has a message. And we're gay. I you know, I talked to the leadership in the chorus and said, don't be afraid. If you're not there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with capitalizing on this moment. We've said for a long time we want to stand up and mean something. The opportunity's been handed to us. The mistake would be to not take it. Say yes. Do these things. Put the message out there and do it for the right reasons. Well, I said to Tony the other day, his manager, you know, There are a lot of survivors in a lot of ways. Most of them can't, can't stand up and talk to the world. It's not a part of who they are. But he can. I remember eighth grade, there was this thing happening. And, you know, one of the kids at school, and I went home and I complained to my mother about it. And she said, who did you talk to? I was like, no one. Not me. Well, you know, you should. It's like, why? It's like, well, because you can. So the next day I marched myself into the principal's office and complained on behalf of somebody who couldn't. Those who can need to. Tony can stand up and talk to the world about his experience and maybe change the world's thinking little bit by little bit by doing that. And he should. He's not opportunistic. He has a message that needs to be heard, and he's capable of delivering it. And he can do that on behalf of victims everywhere. He should. The chorus is an opportunity. We should. We can. It's not opportunistic. 
Yes. Does it move our agenda forward? The agenda we've had long before this happened. Absolutely. But it's still the right thing to do. And it's for the right reasons. That's what we should do. We should keep saying yes to the opportunities that arise. And over time, it's already happening, that they're, they're not about that anymore. We have to sing with the Second Harvest Food Bank, because I go to their dinners, and I know the organizer there, and she likes me. And after this happened, she said to me, you sing with the gay chorus? It's like, yes, I do. I want to talk to you about it. I said, not that I want to talk to, but boy, can I get you in touch with the person who is. And we got to do this amazing event for an audience that we would otherwise never touch. Change their perception of a lot of things. We got to sing the national anthem at the first responders breakfast. This is not a group of people who are going to just suddenly say, oh gosh, we need to have the Orlando Gay Chorus come and sing. We're going to sing for the AFL-CIO. Jimmy Hoffa's union, we're going to sing for them. The gay chorus in Orlando is going to sing for Jimmy Hoffa's union. That was not going to happen before. And now, it is. So, you know, what's going to come of this? I hope that. I hope lots of things like that. I hope a dialogue in music for us that lets people have a different experience of what gay means. And then maybe the world really can change. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today, Richard. I really appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I mean, I, that was a great that was a great place to end, I think. Yeah. No, you don't, you don't want to get me started on Lucy, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> read the blog. We can always do a second interview. <laughs> read, read the blog on Lucy. <laughs> did you find my blog? I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. Well, that's an interview for another time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah this, thank you. You know, it's like, this will go into an archive, and who knows, maybe some researcher 100 years from now will look at it, but probably other than that, nothing. Oh. That's okay. It's fantastic. Well, this, is, uh, this has been Jeffrey Cravero with Richard Lamberty in the conference room of the Center for Humanities and Digital Research at UCF in Orlando, Florida on Tuesday, October 11, 2016.